All right. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Russian Iterations Health Education Lecture. Um, Russian Iterations is delighted to be your source of information, resources, and health promotion programs that help maximize your well being and good health as you wish. Today is Wednesday, March 20th. And uh, I'm Grisel Rodriguez Morales, Rush Generations Program Director. I'll be your moderator for today's lecture titled Kidney and Liver Health. And we are so delighted to have today two STEAM Rush colleagues joining us. Before I introduce them, though, I'd like to first start by uh, thanking our producer, Hannah Weitzman. And Hannah, as she normally does, will be helping us manage the chat and other key features uh, during this event so that we all can have a great discussion. As you know, we are live streaming this lecture via our YouTube channel where we have dozens of other health education lectures that you can always refer to. Uh, please feel free to let friends, families, colleagues uh, know about our channel and any of the lectures we've offered so that they can also benefit from the valuable information that our speakers offer, offer every other week through Russian Generations. And we are using <clears throat> the video platform Zoom, which also allows us to host a good number of people that join us via phone. For those of you on YouTube, we ask that you please use the chat function to ask questions, on or to add to the discussion throughout the lecture. We will make sure that your comments and questions make it to today's presenters. And for those of you listening to the discussion via soon, you will also have a, an opportunity at the end to unmute your audio so that you can ask your questions. We greatly appreciate all of you joining us today. Now, please remember, that the information that we offer here is for general informational purposes only, and that for situations specific to you, we always encourage you to seek additional professional advice so that your specific needs are met, okay? Um, we'll have Andrea Pabon, Andrea Pabon speak first. Andrea grew up in Chicago and has been a part of Rush since 2015, having worked with adults primarily in internal medicine, home-based primary care, and nephrology. She completed her doctorate of nursing practice from Rush, focusing on adult and gerontologic primary care, and is currently working with in the Rush Nephrology and Hypertension Clinic. She has a passion for all things kidney related, including education, dialysis, and kidney transplant. In her free times, she enjoys cooking, traveling, and running. Thank you so much for having, for being here, Andrea. Then we'll have Sarah Repkin, who graduated with her Master of Science in Nursing in 2008 from Vanderbilt University. She has been a nurse practitioner in the hepatology department at Rush University Medical Center since 2012. She manages acute and chronic liver disease as well as pre and post liver transplant patients. She completed her doctorate of nursing practice also here at Rush University at the College of Nursing in 2022 and joined the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing faculty as a part-time clinic instructor as well. Thank you so much also for being here, Sarah. So without further ado, I'll have the screen to, I'll handle it, I'll handle it to um, Andrea. Excellent. Thank you so much, Grisel, for the introduction and uh, Hannah for hosting this excellent education platform. I think Breast Generations is a great tool to be able to reach the, the community and a powerful tool for education as well. Um, so today I'm here to talk about kidney health education. 
um, we can go ahead and advance to the next slide. So today I want to cover how kidneys function and what causes kidney disease. We're gonna talk about what health changes can be made to take control of kidney disease. We're gonna learn about kidney disease complications and different treatment options. Lastly, we'll talk about how diet and nutrition can impact kidney disease. So when we talk about nephrology, uh, I think it's important to, to start by understanding what we are talking about. So nephrology, you may hear, or you may hear the word renal. All of these are words that describe medicine of the kidneys. So a nephrologist is a, is a kidney doctor. Uh, nephrology deals with the diseases of the kidneys, as well as any electrolyte abnormalities, resistant high blood pressure or hypertension, um, issues like kidney stones, kidney transplant. And one thing that's important to define is the difference between a urologist and a nephrologist, which I know those words sound similar, but the, the medicine is different, where the urologist are surgeons who specialize in the bladder and the urinary tract system and the male reproductive system. There is some overlap in some of the, the medicine that we do, but just want to start off by, by defining that separation. So we talk about the impact of kidney disease in the United States. We know that 37 million people in the U.S. have chronic kidney disease, which is about 15% of Americans or one in seven people. In the U.S. currently, there are 500,000 people on some form of dialysis, whether it's a home dialysis or an in-center dialysis. And kidney disease is important to think of as uh, on a spectrum. This disease often spans uh, decades, um, and it's important to detect and to screen because we know that kidney disease can shorten lifespan by anywhere from five to, to 15 years. And the earlier that kidney disease is detected, the more we can do about it. Kidney disease is an under-recognized health crisis. Um, and something that's important when it comes to why we screen is that kidney disease is often silent. Uh, our statistics show that only 10% of patients know that they have kidney disease. When we compare this to, to something like diabetes or high cholesterol, closer to 75% of people are aware that they have these conditions. What do kidneys do? Well, most people are born with two of them, right? And the kidneys, they help filter the blood. They help clean the blood and get rid of, of waste products. Uh, they help balance the volume of fluid in our body and make urine. The kidneys also maintain the balance of minerals and electrolytes, some very important ones being sodium and potassium and phosphorus. Kidneys play a huge role in regulating blood pressure as well as removing acid and waste from the blood. Kidneys are very important. They also help make the hormone that produces red blood cells in our body. One thing that we see common in people who have advanced chronic kidney disease is that they often may have some findings of anemia where their red blood cell levels are lower than normal. And that can cause a lot of uh, fatigue, weakness. And so this is something that we see because the kidney, healthy kidneys make this hormone. The kidneys also help keep bones healthy by regulating the calcium and phosphorus balance in the blood. They help remove the extra waste that our body doesn't need by controlling acid, acid levels in the blood. Um, we know that most people are born with two kidneys. Sometimes for congenital reasons, people are born with one or the two kidneys don't, don't fuse and they don't separate. Um, but you do only need one kidney to, to survive. The body can live with one kidney, one healthy kidney. And usually the kidney is about the size of our fists. When we talk about what causes chronic kidney disease, the number one and two reasons in the United States are conditions of diabetes and high blood pressure. And this is reflective of what we see in, in clinic. Um, this is gonna be the majority of the reason why people have chronic kidney disease. Um, other conditions that can cause this chronic kidney disease is obesity and in issues like kidney stones or infections, um, certain injuries, uh, vasculitis, 
um, certain medications, most commonly uh, excessive use of medications called NSAIDs in that class are medications like Aleve, Ibuprofen, Advil, Naproxen, Motrin. While these medications are safe for people to take who do not have kidney disease, taken in excess can cause permanent damage to the kidney. Nephrotoxins is a word for different agents, medications that may be toxic to the kidney. Uh, oftentimes we see, for example, certain immunosuppressive therapy or people who have cancer and are undergoing chemotherapy. And uh, while that treatment is treating the cancer, sometimes the, the medication itself can be toxic to the kidneys. So how do we check for kidney disease? The good thing is there are many ways we can check for kidney disease. Most commonly, and this is something that primary care doctors do very often, is order certain blood tests, one of them being called a CMP, which is a, a metabolic panel. And on that metabolic panel, we are able to measure a marker called the creatinine. The creatinine is a number that we look for to, to be around one, one or less. And this number can fluctuate depending on hydration status, depending on um, uh, recent surgeries, depending on any sort of um, toxic insult. Um, but based on this creatinine level, we are able to use it to predict and estimate what the kidney function is. So normal kidney function is anything greater than 90%. Kidney failure is anything less than 15%. So based on the creatinine, which we're able to draw from a simple blood test, we're able to estimate what the kidney function is. We also know that the kidneys make urine. And so when we look at the urine, we're able to see under a microscope different components of things that are in the urine, whether is normal or abnormal. Um, so certain things we look for are things like protein in the urine or microscopic blood in the urine. Um, and because urine is the end result of uh, what kidneys do, it's able to tell us a lot about the function of the kidney. We have another way to check for kidney disease, and this is through a kidney ultrasound. An ultrasound is a non-invasive um, test that does not cause any sort of radiation exposure that is safe for everyone. And it allows us to get imaging of the kidneys. And we use this to look for confirmation of does the person have two kidneys, first of all? Is there any sort of kidney stone that could be obstructing and causing an elevation in the creatinine or abnormal kidney function? Is there some sort of backflow of urine where urine is flowing in the wrong direction because of some obstruction or blockage? And so it's a quick, easy, and safe test with the kidney ultrasound that's able to really tell us a lot as we are making the diagnosis of kidney disease and, and just as importantly, trying to understand the why of the kidney disease. Kidney disease is a spectrum. There are different stages. So based on the kidney function rate, we're able to know what the percentage of kidney function is. We know that there are five stages of chronic kidney disease. Stage one is the most mild and stage five is considered kidney failure. The stages are based on the, on the function of, of the kidneys, the percentage function. Um, so when we talk about what's normal kidney function, that GFR number is going to be greater than, than 90%. Um, stages one to three are considered mild kidney disease. Once the kidney function gets uh, to 45%, between 30 and 45%, that tells us that we're in stage 3B. Um, and stage th 3B, stage 4, and stage 5 are often when the nephrologist starts seeing people with chronic kidney disease prior to that. This is something that often um, the primary care doctor, uh, primary care doctors are, are, uh, are managing. Um, so when stage 6, which isn't on here, is when kidneys have failed to the point of needing some sort of treatment such as dialysis or kidney transplant. Oftentimes people don't feel chronic kidney disease until we get to stage four or stage five. 
um, which is goes to show the importance of, of screening and going to your annual doctor's appointment and getting blood work done so that we can detect this as early as possible because there's a lot we can do for it. So what are symptoms of kidney disease? So we know that symptoms of kidney disease don't typically, people don't typically feel them until stage four or stage five. So if we know that healthy kidneys help clean the blood, they help remove waste by excreting urine, they help regulate the blood pressure, they help maintain normal red blood cell levels, they help maintain bone health. That's what healthy kidneys do. So if kidneys aren't working, at 100%, or let's say if kidneys are working less than 30%, we start to see that each of those processes are impaired. And so that waste, that buildup can hang out and linger in the blood longer than it needs to. And it causes these physical symptoms from the presence of those toxins. Some of these symptoms we look for in people with advanced kidney disease can be symptoms of fluid buildup. Fluid buildup or swelling of the feet, of the ankles, of both legs, of the stomach. And sometimes if the swelling rises high enough, people can feel short of breath where the swelling is around their torso. We can see that people with advanced chronic kidney disease in stage four or five often have nausea, vomiting. They may have a loss of appetite and lose weight as a result. Oftentimes people will feel fatigue and weakness. Some of this can be from the anemia that they may have, knowing that healthy kidneys make the hormone for red blood cells and failing kidneys are, aren't, are not able to do that. People often have insomnia or will complain of different um, sleeping challenges and kind of describe a brain fog or a decrease in, in mental sharpness. All of these symptoms are a result of the ure uremia or the toxins that are being built up in the blood because the kidneys aren't able to, to do the job that they were designed to do. Most people who have stages one to three B or mild to moderate kidney disease will not feel any different. And oftentimes when they come and see me in clinic and I'm telling them that they have chronic kidney disease, sometimes it's hard for them to believe it because they feel so normal, because they feel like themselves. But fortunately, we have a lot of ways to confirm chronic kidney disease through the blood testing, through the urine testing, and through the kidney ultrasound. Um, that really gives us an understanding of, of where we're at, where the kidney disease is at, and hopefully an understanding of why it occurred. When we talk about kidney disease prevention, so there's, there are many things that the person can do to, to prevent this chronic disease. Like we recommend to anyone, we try to maintain a healthy diet and a healthy weight. We know that the number one and two reasons for kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, is diabetes and high blood pressure. So controlling those chronic conditions. For blood pressure, that looks like a goal of 130 over 80. Everyone's normal blood pressure is different, right? But we try to try to aim for 130 over 80. For diabetes, that looks like an A1C of less than 7.5%. A1C is something that primary care doctors typically test for or diabetes doctors who, because those are the kinds of doctors who manage diabetes, an endocrinologist. And what we're looking for is an A1C less than 7.5%. A1C is a way, it's a blood test that we can use to measure the average blood sugar over the past 120 days. Um, and so it gives us a really good understanding of how controlled the, the, the diabetes is. We also know the impact of tobacco use on chronic kidney disease. There is data to show that tobacco use on kidneys can cause as much damage as diabetes can. So when people come in and they're asking, how can I slow down the progression of the kidney disease? Yes, there are medications that can do that. But just as importantly, there are non-pharmacological ways that the, that the person has control over that they can do. And tobacco cessation is an important one. 
And another big thing that we can do to prevent kidney disease is avoiding kidney toxic medication. Now, most kidney toxic medications you would need uh, a prescription for. However, there are over-the-counter medications such as that class of NSAIDs, the Aleve, the ibuprofen, the naproxen, the Motrin, that when taken in excess for an extended period of time can cause damage to the kidney. So again, people who have healthy kidney function, they're able to take NSAIDs uh, at the recommended dosages. We see this often in people who have chronic joint pain. Maybe they're a construction worker and they have chronic arthritis. And the only thing that works for them are these anti-inflammatory drugs. And sometimes we see that they're taken more than, than the prescribed dose. And that is when for an extended period of time. And that's where we can see that, that, the, that the damage can occur. So what can you do if you have kidney disease? So um, I would say start by seeing your primary care doctor on, on a regular basis. That means, you know, going at least once a year, uh, doing the recommended follow-up that they're advising and getting blood work. There is no way to tell what the kidneys are doing unless we're checking labs via blood work or, or a urine sample. If the primary care doctor sees that the creatinine, which is that marker in the blood, is elevated or that there's protein in the urine, they may recommend you to a nephrologist or, or a kidney doctor. And it's in, I think platforms like this, like Rush Generation, are so important so that we can learn about the disease so that we have an awareness of it and understanding the different treatment options. There are many treatment options to slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. Many of these are medications that help control the blood pressure, but long-term, they're also kidney protective. Um, and so we see that these medications that are oral medications, typically once or twice a day, are ones that not only control the blood pressure, which we know helps prevent kidney disease or slow it down, but also long-term have kidney protective effects. The goal when someone comes to see me in clinic and they have chronic kidney disease, whether I'm diagnosing it or whether we already know they have it, is to do whatever we can to slow the progression, meaning that they may come whatever stage two, three, four, even five when they're referred first to see a kidney doctor and my job is to see how, how much we can push the stop sign of kidney failure down the road so that we can do whatever we can to delay kidney failure. In the event that people, that the disease progresses from kidney disease to kidney failure, when that percentage is less than 15%, there's different treatment options. The two treatment options that we focus on is number one being a kidney transplant and number two being dialysis. Kidney transplant is the only way to cure kidney failure. When kidneys have failed, whether it's from diabetes or high blood pressure for decades, or sometimes there are immune or congenital reasons that, that kidneys can fail, that damage that's done is permanent. And so when we see it coming, when people are starting to see me at stage you know, three and their kidney functions 50%, there's a lot we can do to slow the progression down and move kidney failure further and further down the line. But it's a progressive disease. And so by, by nature, if the kidneys fail, then what we can do is have a kidney transplant done. And uh, this can either be from a living donor or a cadaver donor where someone passed away, but their organ is still viable and they, they chose to continue to give it life in someone who needed it. Um, and so kidney transplant is the, gives the best outcomes for people who have kidney failure. It gives the most longevity. It, it has the best outcomes for for many different things. And unfortunately, there are many more people in the United States who need a kidney than there are kidneys that are available. And as a result, there's often a wait list for a kidney transplant. And 
Some of you may know people in your community that have had one or maybe that have been on dialysis. And depending on where the kidney comes from, meaning a living donor or a deceased donor determines the wait time. Um, so when we think about kidney transplant for someone who has kidney failure, that is the end goal, is the transplant. However, dialysis is used as a bridge to get us to kidney transplant. 50 years ago, we didn't have dialysis for the kidneys. And when the kidneys failed, the body failed. But now we have multiple modalities with dialysis, whether it be in a center, hemodialysis, or whether it be dialysis done in the home, which we're doing more and more of, which is peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis. And dialysis is not the end goal, but it's what buys us time and allows us to get to a kidney transplant. So when that's that's what we see. We try to slow the progression of the kidney disease, but if kidneys fail, we do have we do have other options. Understanding that kidney failure is a huge lifestyle change for people, but the disease can be managed across the spectrum and it's really important to understand that you have options, um, many different options, and the choice that you make is important to pair with what your goals are and also what will fit into your day-to-day. -day. You go to the next slide. I last I wanna conclude with a component on nutrition and kidney disease and just because of the impact that it can have. When we talk about what nutritional changes we can make to have a positive impact on kidney disease, we, we learned that blood pressure, controlling blood pressure is a huge part of slowing down the progression of kidney disease or preventing it. And a lot of times when there we have a diet that's high in salt, that's the high salt levels makes our body retain more fluid and that can cause blood pressure to go up because we know where salt goes, water will follow. So if someone's diagnosed with high blood pressure, which is very common that people have high blood pressure in the United States, that they may be prescribed a blood pressure medication to lower it. However, if we're eating a diet that's high in salt, the medication can't do its job. It's like they're fighting each other. And so the blood pressure may be harder to control if we have a diet that's high in salt, even if we're taking our blood pressure medication every day. We know that salt is an acquired taste, right? And we want our food to taste good, right? So what are some different ways we can flavor the food that won't keep our blood pressure high? And these are these are different spices. There's basil, there's oregano, there's parsley, there's rosemary. All of these are spices that can give us flavor to the food, but will not keep our blood pressure high. We we Cooking at home is great if that's an option for for you. And the reason is, you know, what's going in your food. When we, when we're eating out several times a week and we're going to restaurants, we don't really know how they're preparing the food. Is there a lot of salt in it? Then we get home and then we're salting it further, right? So it's kind of a mystery really what's in it. When we cook at home, we're able to know the different components of it. Salt is in everything. It's very difficult to avoid. And I'm not saying no salt. It's just having an awareness of how much we're taking in a day. The recommendation is less than 2,000 milligrams or, or two grams in one day. Fortunately, sodium content or salt content is something that's on every nu nutrition label, whether it be from crackers to drinks to meats, and you're able to see exactly what's in it. Foods that have the highest salt are um, different marinated like different marinades, pre-marinated meats, soy sauces, um, ramen has as much salt in one package as the recommended daily intake, right? So it's not, there. it's not don't ever eat these. It's just, you know, have an awareness about what you're putting into your body and how it can be impacting your health, specifically your, your, your blood pressure. Oftentimes people will come and ask me, I'm taking so many meds. I feel like I'm taking so many medications. How can I get off of some of these? And one thing that we know work by eating less salt, we often see that the blood pressure can come down. And sometimes we're even able to eliminate and remove medications simply from that lifestyle change. 
Another thing we can do is that when we eat foods with fat, which is important to our body to have good fats, that we're choosing ones that give back to our body in a nutritious way. And these are things like when we're cooking and eating using olive oil or canola oil instead of butter, when we're eating different meats or fish that they're in a, they're baked or they're grilled or broiled versus having them deep fried. There's a lot of healthy fats that we can get from plant-based, um, plant-based uh, alternatives and any sort of, of food that has fat-free or low-fat dairy products will also have less fat in them. Sugar is another big one, right? We, we like the way it tastes. It's, you know, some people have the sweet tooth. Some people, I've learned, just really don't like drinking plain water, right? And so certain things we can do are choosing water or calorie-free beverages, uh, limiting soda and, and not having it every day, trying to replace it with a, a smoothie or something fruit-based. Um, there's a lot of sugar that sneaks up in flavored coffee creamers. They're often very concentrated. So just having an awareness of, of you know, what, what we're pouring in our coffee every day. And if we want flavor, we want something sweet, try adding fresh fruit to your water and that fresh fruit will help infuse some of the, uh, some of those natural flavors that make, make the beverage taste good. And like for anyone, whether they have kidney disease or not, we recommend to be active and aim for a healthy weight. Why? Because we know this lowers blood pressure. We know that we can have better blood sugar control out of this. If someone's a, a diabetic, there's medications that are prescribed for this, but we always recommend to aim for a healthy weight and be active. Just like blood pressure, sometimes through lifestyle changes, people are able to get off of some of their diabetes medications. We also know that, the, that these factors of, of being active and aiming for a healthy weight can lower cholesterol levels, which helps reduce the risk of heart attack or, or stroke. Um, being active every day, this, this means uh, something as simple as going for a walk. Walking is exercise, right? Go for a walk after lunch, after dinner, meet up with, with friends or family and, and have someone that you can en engage with to do a group activity, to help with accountability, to, to help stay active. Um, and, you know, like for me, I, I like to run, but I've learned that not everyone likes to run. So then don't run, right? There's other ways that we can be active. Dance, swim, yoga, try a new sport, right? Really anything just to get your, your, your body moving. Your body will so thank you for it. And you will see a lot of positive changes that can, that can impact not just the kidney health, but the overall health as well. So I want to thank you for your attention um, and time. If you, uh, we'll do questions at the end, but if you have um, someone in your life or, or you know someone or yourself that has a kidney disease of any sort and they're looking for a kidney doctor, um, here at Rush, we have our Rush Nephrology and Hypertension Clinic, where a clinic composed of myself and two of my nephrology colleagues were located in the professional building on the seventh floor. We have appointments five days a week. Um, there's a QR code if you'd like to uh, scan it and learn more about it or a phone number if you have any questions. Um, and I thank you for your time. Um, go ahead. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Grizel and Hannah, for um, having me today to speak at Rush Generations. And thank you, Andrea, for that fabulous um, presentation on kidney health. I learned some things, too. Um, so my name is Sarah. I'm a nurse practitioner in the uh, liver clinic at Rush Medical Center. And today, I'm going to talk to you about a few things. The role of the liver. We're going to talk about you know, the actual anatomy, where it is and what it does. And then I'm just going to touch on some very common li liver issues, specifically 
the viral hepatitis is, so hepatitis A, B, and C. We'll talk a little bit about alcohol in your liver and then medications in your liver. There's a lot of questions out there on certain medications that are or are not safe. So the liver um, is right, sits at the uh, right upper part of the abdomen. It's below the diaphragm on top of the stomach, um, on top of the right kidney and the intestines. And the funny thing about the liver, it actually has no nerve endings in it. So it doesn't typically cause pain. So sometimes when you have pain in that right upper quadrant or right upper side of the belly, people immediately think the liver, but a lot of times it's not. It could be the gallbladder, it could be your intestine, um, but, but that is where it sits in that right side. The liver has two main lobes. It has the right and the left, and it has two main sources of blood flow, and that comes from three different types of vessels. We have the hepatic artery, which is very important. It carries oxygenated blood flow into the liver, so it keeps that liver functioning. We have the portal vein, which carries nutrient-rich blood to the liver, so it comes from the, the stomach and carries all those nutrients into the liver. And then we have the hepatic vein that sends oxygen and poor blood back to the body, and it's, it's sending it back up to the lungs to be oxygenated and go through the whole cycle again. The liver can perform over 500 functions. It's very, very, very important. Obviously, I'm very biased because that's what I study, but it is very important. Um, and the reason I bolded the detoxification of chemicals and medications is because I think it's so important to realize the liver is its own detoxification system. It's almost like a factory of the body. Everything that you take in has to go to the liver and it decides what's important and what's not. And it's gonna take out a lot of those bad things and send them down to the kidneys and into the intestine to be excreted. And so the reason I bring this up is that I think we have to be really careful when we see ads on, on social media, on TV, um, that talk about, you know, liver detox um, um, pills and, and uh, liquids and things like that. Because a lot of times it's really difficult to detox an organ that already detoxes itself. And so I always want to bring to mind and tell patients to be very, very careful with those products because we're not totally sure what, the, what they do. And then the liver is one of the few organs in the body that is capable of regeneration. And it's not true regeneration, it's compensatory growth, meaning that the mass can be replaced, but not necessarily the shape. So it may not look the same as it's regenerating as, it's regenerating as it did originally. And what's amazing about this organ is that as little as 10 to 25% of the liver can regenerate to back to its full size. The problem is once your liver has scarring or what we call cirrhosis, it's unable to regenerate working tissue, meaning that you're not gonna be able to reproduce uh, regular tissue for it to do its job. And similar to the kidneys, the liver disease is on a spectrum. Um, over here we have F0 or no fibrosis and fibrosis is a fancy word for stiffening of the liver. And as we get over here to stage four, that's where we have cirrhosis or that irreversible scarring. And a lot of times there's really no set symptoms of the liver disease progression. Even people who come to see me who we diagnose them with cirrhosis for the first time, unless they're like decompensating and in failure, the most common symptom we see is, you know, fatigue or just very vague symptoms of I don't feel well. Now, if people are coming in and they're bright yellow, meaning that the liver is failing, that's obviously um, another problem. But the liver disease progression, typically, it's a very, very slow progression. It can take upwards to 20 years to develop the cirrhosis, depending on what type of underlying problem you have. So the first common liver problem I want to talk about is viral hepatitis. And um, viral hepatitis these are, it's a virus that actually lives in your blood, but we say it makes a home for itself in the liver. And that's where we start to see the liver effect. But we actually diagnose it through blood tests. And what happens is that when the liver acknowledges that that virus is there, it realizes, hey, you're not supposed to be here. And the liver is going to try and repair itself. It's going to try to regenerate. 
And it's that ongoing attempt that of repairing itself over and over and over again that causes inflammation or swelling. And over time, that swelling or inflammation can cause that stiffening and develop to scarring over time. So the most, there's three very common types of virus hepatitis in the U.S. There's five total that we typically see, but the most common are hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. And I'm not going to go into detail of each and every one because I'll keep you guys here for two hours and we don't have that kind of time. But what I do want to draw your attention to is that we have ways to protect yourself against both hepatitis A and hepatitis B. With hepatitis A, there's uh, three different types of vaccines that we can give. Um, the most common is this first one, Habrix, and it's uh, two doses over a six-month period. So theoretically, you would get the first dose, and then six months later, you get the second dose, and then you're done, and you typically have that immunity lifelong, so you don't have to worry about um, getting sick if you were exposed to it. Hepatitis B, we have a few more options, but the most common one we see now is called a Heplislav. That's the one at the bottom here. Um, and it's actually only a two-dose vaccine series over a one-month period. So you would get one at the start, the second one at month one, and then you're done. Um, the most common vaccine for hepatitis B that you know I got when I was a child, most people who, who are um, my age or older got this one up here called Endurix. And that's a three-dose series. Um, it's still available, but when Heplislav became available, it was actually shown to be more effective. And like hepatitis A vaccines, when you have the hepatitis B vaccine, it typically lasts lifelong. Once in a while, we'll see people lose their immunity so we can give them a booster, but you typically have that protection lifelong. So with hepatitis C, that's a very common one. There's a lot of... Um, uh, uh, publicity on hepatitis C treatment that's been out for a number of years. There's no vaccine for hepatitis C. Um, and it's still, um, unfortunately, one of the most common liver diseases we see. And right now, still the most common reason for people to get liver transplant. Uh, about five and a half to six million people in the U.S. have hepatitis C, whether they like it or whether they know it or not. And about 170 million people worldwide. Um, one thing with hepatitis C is that there were new medications that came out in 2015 that are all oral therapy and have anywhere from a 97 to a 99% uh, cure rate. It is a complete cure. It's not one of those things where you have to take medicine forever and you're, you're always at risk of it coming back. It completely eliminates it. So if you know anyone um, you know, that's struggling with hepatitis C um, or has never been treated or is nervous with treatment, I would encourage them to talk to their providers because there's multiple treatments out there with minimal side effects and you can have an actual cure. Uh, a new guideline that came out in 2020 uh, during COVID, so it might've gotten missed, but everyone 18 and up should be tested at least once in their life for hepatitis C. Now, if you have risk factors for hepatitis C, if you um, uh, dabbled or used IV drugs or nasal drugs, um, if you share needles, um, then you should be tested more often. But the new guidelines is that every single person who is 18 or older should be tested once in their lifetime. So now we're going to talk about one of my favorite things to talk about is uh, alcohol and the liver and how uh, uh, it affects the liver. So the first thing I always tell my patients when we have a discussion about alcohol is that they need to know what's considered a drink. There's misrepresentation um, out there that, you know, beer is less of an alcohol that, than wine. And that's actually not true. 12 ounces of beer is the same as five ounces of wine, which is the same as one and a half ounces of a spirit or a shot. And so all of these are considered alcohol. So if someone is encouraging you to limit your alcohol, that doesn't just mean hard liquor or wine, it means all types of alcohol. The current recommendations from the CDC or the Center of Disease Control and the Dietary Guidelines for Americans is less than two drinks per day for men and less than one drink per day for women. So sorry, ladies, we don't have as much of a um, uh, amount that we're allowed to drink as the men. 
However, what I want to draw your attention to is that during COVID between 2020 and 2022, we had a huge uptick in alcohol use disorder and mortality or deaths related to alcohol. And so a couple numbers that I wanted to throw out there was that in 2019, 15% of, of uh, I'm sorry, the mortality rate from alcohol increased by, fi- by 15%. In 2020, it went up to 19%. And in 2021, it went all the way up to 20%. So that's um, uh, per 100,000 persons of alcohol use disorder mortality. Um, so huge, huge uptick from um, 2018 to 2021 during the pandemic. And we definitely saw that here at uh, Rush as well. Um, many more people coming in with um, alcohol-associated liver disease, um, alcohol-associated liver failure, and the need for transplantation. And when you drink too much, there's a handful of things that can happen. Just because you know people do drink or you have the occasional alcohol or even a daily alcohol doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have liver disease. The first thing that happens is that you can get intoxicated. Um, You can get alcohol poisoning, which becomes a medical emergency. You see that a lot in um, college age students who um, are experimenting and they don't know how much is too much. Um, But what we typically see in the clinic is alcohol associated steatotic liver disease or it's uh, fat infiltration in the liver from excess alcohol use. We can also see alcohol associated hepatitis where you get severe or significant liver inflammation from alcohol use. And then we also see alcoholic cirrhosis, where we have that irreversible scarring from ongoing alcohol use. And I use this word decompensation. So there's some people who can have uh, alcohol-associated cirrhosis or scarring and have significant liver problems. They can get fluid buildup in their stomach called ascites. They can become confused because of uh, elevated ammonia levels in their brain because their liver can't break it down. Um, They can develop um, bleeding in their stomach. Um, And that's what we call decompensated. Now, there's some people who have compensated alcohol cirrhosis, meaning that, yes, they have the scarring, but their liver has kind of figured out how to deal with the cards it has, basically, where, yes, it's scarred, but it can still kind of do its its normal day-to-day functions, maybe not at a normal rate as a um, person without cirrhosis, but they don't have those other problems of decompensation. Either way, the number one treatment for alcohol-associated liver disease is to abstain from alcohol completely. Because what happens is if you are able to take out that inciting factor or the alcohol use, you give your your liver a chance to recover. Remember, it can regenerate if it doesn't have that irreversible scarring. So even with significant liver inflammation or hepatitis, if we when we see these patients completely abstain from alcohol, their liver actually can get better and then they can go on to live you know, a a relatively normal life, they still have to see us very periodically, um, but they don't have long-term effects of the liver disease from their alcohol use. So recommendations from me is that there really is no amount of alcohol that's safe. Yes, our, our guidelines say that, you know, less than one drink per day for women is safe. However, if you're drinking seven drinks a week, every week, over time, that could become problematic. I've seen, you know, patients as young as 26 develop significant irreversible liver disease from ongoing alcohol use. So we say there's really no amount of alcohol that's safe. And anyone with liver disease, regardless of the cause, should avoid alcohol. And the reason being is that we know alcohol is a toxin to the liver. So even if you have liver disease from hepatitis C, from metabolic liver disease, Alcohol can hasten the progression. And if you remember that scale of zero to four, it can progress you from stage two to stage four much more quickly um, with with ongoing alcohol use. So we just recommend to avoid it completely. There's a handful of um, uh, tools out there that you can evaluate, uh, examine your own drinking habits if you're concerned. Um, This one is the CAGE questionnaire and all of these are online. Um, and it helps you kind of decide or give you a, a evaluation tool to, to see if you feel like your drinking patterns are too high or too much. Another one is called the Audit C, 
Um, this is the one we use in, in our clinic. And when we refer to our psychologists or psychiatrist friends, they'll use this as well. And it's another tool that you can use to evaluate your own drinking patterns. And if you have concerns, I recommend you you talk to your primary care provider about it. Some people I know, you know, sometimes people get embarrassed or they, they don't want to talk about it or they feel it's not a problem. You know, um, I know I can speak for myself and most of my colleagues at Rush, no one here is, is judging you if there's concern. If anything, we'll, you know, commend you for bringing it to our attention because maybe we don't know. Um, so if you ever have a concern, please, please talk to your provider. Better to talk it out and figure out the problem or if there is a problem than to keep it inside and have it, you know, become a more severe problem later down the line. These are a handful of um, resources there. The American Liver Foundation has multiple types of resources, whether it's online, um, Facebook, Twitter, uh, phone, phone lines for resources for uh, uh, alcohol use and, and relapse and uh, addiction resources. Um, and there's other ones here in, in Illinois and um, in the city of Chicago as well. Um, so if you have concerns, there's many, many resources out there to, to help. So the last thing I want to talk about is medications and your liver. So what happens a lot of times in our clinic is that, you know, people come in with, with uh, elevated liver enzymes and we're, we go through our whole spectrum of trying to figure out what's going on. You know, there, there's no viruses, there's no autoimmune issues, there's no genetic issues, there's no alcohol use. So we're kind of scratching our heads a little bit. And so sometimes we'll do a really deep intake on medications they're taking both prescribed and over the counter. There's a lot of medicines out there that are not approved by the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. And these are specific like herbal and dietary supplements. We call those HDS for short. The problem with these because they're not approved is that we don't necessarily know what's in it. And sometimes they have the potential to cause drug-induced liver injury. And sometimes we'll use uh, the term DILI for short. So if you ever see that come up, it means drug-induced liver injury. There's a resource out there called Liver Tox. And to be honest, I didn't learn about this until I started working in hepatology. Um, but it's a free website and it provides up-to-date, unbiased, and easily accessible information on diagnosis, cause, frequency, clinical patterns and management for non-prescription medicines and many herbal drug um, and diet, herbal and dietary supplements. So if you're questioning whether or not you're taking a medication, if it's safe, your provider or even yourself can look it up on this Liver Talks website. The other big question I get is that if you have underlying liver problems, you were told you can't take Tylenol or acetaminophen. And this is absolutely false. Tylenol is absolutely safe, even if you have underlying liver disease. There's a common misconception among not only the general population, but providers as well, that Tylenol can worsen your li liver disease. Now, Tylenol is the leading cause of acute liver failure when taken in excess or having a Tylenol toxicity, but there's no data to show that if it's taken in safe amounts, that it can worsen or harm your liver. And it's actually safer than some other pain medicines out there when taken in the appropriate amounts. So Andrea alluded to, you know, Advil, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve that can harm the kidneys. Those can harm the liver as well. They can cause, um, if you're on medications for who people who are post-transplant, it can uh, interfere with those immunosuppression medications. If you have cirrhosis, it can put you at higher risk to uh, cause bleeding in the stomach. It also puts you at higher risk to cause kidney disease, which Andrea alluded to. And it can also cause fluid retention, meaning that you can get fluid buildup or accumulation in the legs, but also in the stomach as well. So a lot of our patients with um, end-stage or advanced liver disease, we do not recommend any of the Advil's, ibuprofen, Motrin. We actually prefer Tylenol because it's safer. If you do not have liver disease, you can take up to three grams a day. Um, so if you think about an extra strength is 500 milligrams. So um, you can take up to, oh boy, I can't do math for the, <laughs> um, but you can take up to, I think, six or eight of those a day. 
Whereas if you do have liver disease, no more than two grams a day. So that's four 500, mill 500 milligrams um, of Tylenol. So, you know, usually people will take one or two of the Tylenol doses and be fine. Um, but you want to be cognizant of how much you're taking. The other issue to sometimes we see too is that if you take Tylenol and then you're also on another pain medicine that has Tylenol as part of it. So there's a medicine out there called uh, Norco, which has a painkiller, but it also has Tylenol in it. So you want to be very mindful when you're mixing pain medicines that you're not doing too much Tylenol. So a couple key takeaways I just want to go over is that the liver is very important and necessary for life. There are vaccinations against both hepatitis A and B. None against hepatitis C yet. I know there it's in the works though. Um, the CDC recommends no more than uh, or less than one alcoholic drink per day for women and less than two alcoholic drinks per day for men. Unfortunately, alcohol-related deaths have increased since COVID-19. And if you're concerned about your drinking patterns, please talk to your provider. I can't stress that enough. We are here for you. We are here to help you and support you. Um, there's no judgment. Um, it is a, you know, safe uh, space for you to talk about your concerns, including your alcohol use. Remember that herbal and dietary supplements are not approved by the FDA and have the potential to cause liver injury or harm or damage. And Tylenol is typically safe with your liver if taken in the correct amount. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't click the, the, the buttons. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Andrea. Very quickly, because we are needing to wrap up soon, but um, Sarah, do you know why is it that the recommendation about the hepatitis C once in a lifetime or, or at least once in a lifetime, is it because the cases are on the rise? Is that what you were saying? Yes, it's yeah, it's because, you know, initially the recommendation was only those born between 1945 and 1965, the baby boomer population need to get screened. Mm -hmm. And what they've been seeing over the past, you know, 10 to 12 years is that there's a there's a higher uh, incidence of hepatitis C in the younger population. Unfortunately, the younger population is experimenting um, with more IV drug use and nasal drug use. So they're seeing an uptick in that. So they recommended that um, not just to uh, test the older population, but the younger population should be tested as well. And it's to um, completely eradicate hep C by 2030, which we're not on track to do, but they're hoping by 2040 to eradicate it. Mm, thank you. And what, also, can you talk briefly about what can cause the non-alcoholic body liver? Absolutely. I didn't include it in the presentation. I know I only have 20 minutes. Um, okay. So non-alcoholic fatty liver has actually had a new name. We don't call it fatty liver anymore. We call it metabolic liver disease. Sometimes you'll see mazzled, M-A-S-L-D, come up. Um, some providers still use uh, fatty liver, but we're trying to get away from that. Um, it affects about 35% of the population. So there's about 100 million Americans living with it. Um, the most common or notorious uh, other problems that cause metabolic liver disease is diabetes, um, being overweight or having a BMI of greater than 30, um, hypertension, high cholesterol, um, but diabetes is actually the number one most notorious um, disease process that puts you at risk for metabolic liver disease. And oh, one more thing, there was a brand new medication that was just approved on Thursday called Resdifra. It is the first medication we have to treat metabolic liver disease. Um, it hasn't, we haven't gotten the bill access to it yet because it just got approved on Thursday. So there is hope at the end of the line. If you're struggling with it, we have a new medication to treat it because previously all we had to offer was weight loss. Oh, thanks. All right. Also the, those calling, if you would like to unmute to ask a question, remember is star six. Um, in the meantime, let me ask this question also to Andrea. Um, you mentioned that some medications could cause kidney disease. So should people ask for that metabolic panel after a certain number or a certain period of taking cer certain medications? Yeah, that's a good question. That, that metabolic panel has a lot of useful information in it. 
Yes, it tests for kidney disease. It also tests for liver enzymes. It also tests for electrolytes. And so it is likely that primary care doctors are ordering this blood test because of the utility of it. I think that when NSAIDs or kidney toxic medications are taken at the recommended dose, there's a lot less concern for the risk of the impact on kidney disease. If someone came to me and said that they had a sports injury and for one year they took ibuprofen every day, that's something that I would let my provider know. Like Sarah talked about, just because it's over the counter doesn't mean it's safe because of the lack of regulation. And so over-the-counter medications, herbs, supplements, that is part of your medication list. Just because it's marketed as organic or healthy or whatever they put on it, 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 still, it still can impact and interact with other medications. So the more we know as providers, the more we can help. And the bottom line is we're trying to understand the why behind th this disease. Um, so just just bringing it forward is is where I think a great place we can start. And for those individuals that are prone, who are prone to kidney stone, what foods should they avoid? Sure. I think uh, I would say focus more on hydration. Uh, people who have had kidney stones in the past are prone to getting them again. And the best way to do that is by drinking two liters water a day. Um, and that is to help flush and keep things moving forward. Um, depending, there's different uh, different types of stones, depending on what the stone is, is made up of. Sometimes after people pass a stone, they're able to analyze it. Depending on what the stone is made up of, then we can specifically say, avoid foods high in calcium or oxalate or whatnot. But I would say just as a baseline, focus more on drinking the water as opposed to restricting um, certain foods. Thank you. And lastly, before we go into our promo slides, um, would you mind repeating the new medication for metabolic liver disease? <laughs> yes, it's called, it's not the best name, it's called Resdifra, R-E-Z-D-I-F-F-R-A. There might be two Z's in there. I actually have not seen it spelled out yet. We just had our first in-service uh, yesterday. <laughs> um, nice. So I know talking to our pharmacist, we actually don't have it readily available at Rush yet. They're hoping in about a month. Um, there's two doses. I think there's an 80 milligram and a 100 milligram. Um, and it kind of depends. The dosing depends on other medications you're on. Um, and the biggest um, caveat is that you have to have at least stage two fibrosis or above to be eligible um, and then the other question is, we don't know what insurance is going to do or how much it's going to cost yet, but it's called Resdifra. All right. Or res, yeah, Resmeteron is the generic name. Well, thank you so much to both of you for speaking today about maybe the two of the most essential organs in our body. So we greatly appreciate your time. I know that you have clinics, so uh, we will, before you know, we'll let you go again. Thank you for being with us. Um, we are going to actually speak about some of the things that may be helpful so that people is not only about the, the absence of, of disease, what keeps us healthy. So for those of you already dealing with diabetes, hypertension, uh, any other chronic conditions that may get complicated into some of this, then we have some programs for you. All right. Thank you so much. Have Thank a nice you. Day. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Okay. So let me get, oh, thank you so much, Hannah. We have the promo slides already up. So what I'm going to do is start with the Take Charge of Your Health, which is a six week workshop for people with ongoing health conditions. In this, uh, sessions, you will learn how to build skills to gain confidence, to better manage your health, and to lead a more active life. As I said, um, if you don't have to be free of disease. Even if you have a chronic health condition and a diagnosis, you can live a healthy lifestyle. So Take Charge of Your Health is one of those programs for you that is offered over the course of six weeks and where we discuss goal setting, 
nutrition, physical activity, medication and pain management, as well as effective communication and strategies for working well with, with healthcare professionals, excuse me. The next workshop will be held in person here at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, starting April 2nd through May 7th from 9.30 a.m. to noon. And we validate parking when we do it on campus, so please join us. Call 1-800-757-0202 for more information. Then we will be offering cancer thriving and surviving. Um, this is also a free six week supportive workshop for those who are both currently in cancer treatment or in remission. This group is facilitated by two trained leaders. It also meets for two and a half hours once a week for um, six weeks. And it focuses on increasing your ability to manage your health and maintain an active and full life. In this highly interactive workshop, you will learn techniques to deal with problems such as frustration, fatigue, pain, isolation, poor sleep, and living with uncertainty. Um, there's going to be appropriate exercise for regaining and maintaining flexibility and endurance and how to make decisions about treatment and complementary therapies. So also you will learn how to communicate effectively with family, friends, healthcare providers, um, plenty of topics covered in these workshops. The next workshop will be held also in person uh, on Wednesday, starting April 10th through May 15th from 9.30 to noon. And um, if you are interested in this one, please give us a call at 1-800-757-0202. And as I said in the previous one, we will validate parking for you if you participate in this program. Then we'll have gentle chair yoga. Everyone is welcome to do this class, whether you are new to yoga or you have participated or practiced yoga in the past. The poses in this class, we do them actually while standing, but also sitting on the floor or sitting in a chair. The next class will be held via Zoom. This will continue to be virtually on Thursday, starting April 11th through May 16th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. It's a one hour class. And there's a small fee, but also if you, this is a problem, you let us know. We have also scholarships available so that you can take benefit of this class. Again, the number to call is 1-800. 757-0202. Then consider joining our Senior Connections Friendly Caller Program. This program is for adults age 55 and up who are socially isolate, isolated or lonely. We match you with a trained volunteer to receive friendly phone calls for six months. As you heard previously, some of the things have gotten complicated during COVID, right? So we want people to have someone to connect to so that they don't end up having some other problems because they're just by themselves. So we have trained volunteers for this program. And currently we have a study that will help us sustain and expand this program. So if you participate in this study, you will also help us not only continue making friendly calls through this program, but also increase the amount of people that we may serve. So give us a call, 1-800-757-0202 to be part of this. Um, Shaman Senior Voices aims to empower older adults to discuss what matters most to them as they age. So it is very important for people to share what matters most to you with your physician, with your loved ones, and Shellman Senior Voices 
allows you to do that. You can record a video. We want to hear from you about what your thoughts are, but also you get a copy of the video. So please consider sharing your wisdom and on why it is important for your healthcare team and loved ones to know your goals and your wishes and what matters most to you by going into our website. Um, you can do it by just entering bit.ly slash record my story, or you can also scan the QR code to record on a mobile device or smartphone. Okay, and the next lecture that we will have um, in a couple of weeks is recognizing alcohol and substance misuse. It's going to be on Wednesday, April 3rd at 1 p.m. So we hope that you will join us then. Otherwise, um, in the meantime, I mean, uh, feel free to always give us a, a call for any more information about any of the programs or also for assistance if you would like to work with one of our social workers, if you need some type of social assistance with um, any uh, problems you may be facing, the number to call us is 1-800-757-0202. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care.